Tadaki Hara, welcome to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited to have you. We have so much to talk about. Let's go back. 1929, I believe it was, when your father introduced wrestling to, from judo to wrestling in Japan. How did that all get started? Uh, okay, my father was in judo with the, uh, Waseda University, which is in Tokyo. And uh, the team from the university uh, came to the uh, United States to promote, promote judo. And uh, I think it was uh, five or six judo guys there. And they took a boat from uh, Japan to, uh, I think, the West Coast, I think, San Francisco or someplace. And they did uh, judo demonstration in different spots, in different cities, mainly uh, university towns. And uh, when they did this, judo demonstration and they had a judo match the matches with the available wrestlers from the the, uh, the university from that town and uh, what happened was obviously judo in judo judo guys won and they wrestled they took off the jacket and they wrestled and the wrestlers uh, won obviously and then they had the uh, uh, like a grappling match uh, matches like a MMA mm -hmm. thing without punching and kicking, and the wrestlers beat him up soundly, and evidently they got one guy. They put him in the hospital because they hurt his back or something. Put him in the cradle. So my father decided to uh, study wrestling. That's what the wrestling of, you know, Japan started from that particular. For the whole country? Yes, yes. There's no wrestling in, in, in Japan at that time. So when he came back from that trip, uh, actually a year later or two years later, he started a wrestling team at the university, Waseda University, where he was doing judo. Then, uh, maybe same time or maybe a year later, I went to another university and they started wrestling there. And eventually, uh, you know, different universities started wrestling teams. How did he know how to teach the technique and learn? I don't think he knew anything yet. No, he had to learn. He he had to learn from you know zero. He he was pretty good at judo. So throwing part was not probably not that much problem. But uh, you know takedowns, so double leg or single leg or you know sprawling or whatever those you know techniques at that time probably had problems. So he had to learn from, the, you know, zero. Like from books and stuff like that? I don't know. Maybe, he, you know, he, he stuck around with some wrestling coaches. <laughs> you know? And he wrestled at the Olympics not long after that. Yeah, he wrestled the Olympics in 1932. Wow. And so in the, in the preceding years, um, Sorry, in the following years, he comes in contact with the great Myron Roderick, Oklahoma State. What happened there? Yeah, that was much, much later. We're talking about 19, you know, mid 1950s. And Roderick was on the Olympic team in 56. And then a Japanese guy beat him up uh, badly, I think. And then uh, uh, <clears throat> my brother was on a uh, like exchange teams came through the U.S. in fifty. Can't remember years fifty seven or somewhere around there. And uh, he beat a guy from a 
Oklahoma, who was a four, who took fourth place in the NCAA previous year, I think. Mm -hmm. My brother beat him, and uh, I think that's when Roderick said he wanted to come over to Oklahoma State. That was the beginning of the uh, Japanese wrestlers that are coming to uh, Oklahoma State. And they created a dynasty there. We'll talk about some of those guys. Obviously, yourself, you were part of that. The great Yutaki, he was in there. Yeah. Tell me about how you got started, though, in your early years wrestling. Okay. I never wrestled until my sophomore year uh, because the there is no wrestling teams at middle school uh, level. So, you know, Almost everybody started wrestling in high school. High school starts at 10th grade and middle school ends at eighth grade. I'm sorry, ninth grade. That's the you know, Japanese school system. So when I started wrestling, that was already 10th grade. But before that, my three years in uh, middle school, I did judo. So, you know, just transition from judo to wrestling mm -hmm. that time. So you had a little bit of a base. And then what do you guys attribute the uh, kind of the rapid succession of, you know, sophomore, junior, senior, get ready to come in and dominate NCAA wrestling. I mean, and be competitive right away. What was the training like in those three years? Uh, mainly learning takedowns, double leg, single leg, Basically, learning from uh, older wrestlers. There's no, you know, coaches around like here. We just practice, you know, like after school, just go into the uh, wrestling uh, gym. Actually, school. We had a wrestling a room, and there's a next next room was a judo, uh, you know, judo room there. Mm -hmm. so uh, we actually wrestled a lot of uh, full goals and, <laughs> and we only had a one match and we have a you know 20 30 30 guys there and uh, we my high school uh, had a college team in the same place so we worked out with college kids college guys every day and and we practice techniques when you win out on the mat so we had a, like a maybe four pairs wrestling at the same time and other guys are standing around you can just mess around or you know lift weights a little bit here and there uh doing push-ups or uh, you know the dips in the chairs mm -hmm. <laughs> like we didn't have weights like as such we just made we got a cement block or we had a cans filled with cement and then that was uh, dumbbells you know <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that so i was gonna ask you what the cross training was like the running the lifting yeah okay uh, my school had a huge hill actually school buildings up on top of the hill and the wrestling rooms downhill so there's a i don't know how many stores uh, stories but it was pretty steep stairs we have to come down to, yeah. the, to the wrestling room and obviously you have to go up to go home so we use that stairs to run go up and down and that was part of it we did a lot of uh uh you know those rabbit walk or jump or something you know mm -hmm. carry it on your back and go up the steps and things like that and you know I had a chin up bars so we did a lot of chin ups and wrestling in japan is known to really focus <laughs> on the respect respect aspect uh, of the sport, even you know more so than other countries, was that evident back then? Respect um, for coach, respect for like classmates, things like that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, you know, respect even one year difference. You know, like if I'm a senior in high school, and I, act, I was acting as a coach slash captain of the team. And, and uh, sometimes once in a while, the, you know, the college graduates come in, work out. As and so coach. you're you're seeing that yeah. level of respect even for someone one grade up. Yes. Yeah. And before we get to your time at Oklahoma State, I'm just curious. You know, I love history. How prevalent was World War II in, in your upbringing and everyone your age's life in Japan? Okay, in my time. Okay, I can tell you about my experience. Uh, we were in China. I was born in China because my father was in service. He was in the army, a Japanese army. So he was there in China and I was born there. Uh, then three years later, war was over and we had to come back to Japan. And that, that three years, I, don't not, I do not have memory. It's erased. I guess it's a suppressed memory because of, I think it was a, some experience that I don't want to remember. I think it was basically traveling. Everybody got, you know, put it in a, a freight train or a boat to come back here, to come back to Japan. So, my memory starts like when I was a four or five years old in Tokyo. And that was during the rebuild? Yes, yeah, yeah. It was, you know, nothing was there. It was flat, everything's burned. And we split up uh, the family. Uh, I stay with my cousins and other people, you know, my brother and sisters split up someplace else. And we got together a couple of years later. Why'd you split up? Because there was no place to, to live. Wow. <laughs> we came back to nothing, actually. That's crazy. So th you have memories of that, though, just how flat it was and how everything was kind of just starting from, starting from nothing. Yeah, start from scratch. Yeah, actually. Wow. And so that's the kind of the experience you had growing up. What was your fresh first impression of Stillwater, Oklahoma? I, you know, came from, coming from Tokyo. And, uh, you know, I, I used to take a train to go to school. Uh, and, you know, Tokyo is a huge city. Mm -hmm. It came down to Stillwater. There was actually a couple of streets crossing. And that was it. Yeah. <laughs> and then college campus on one side and nothing around it you know cow pastures or you know ranch or whatever open space how did myron's practice compare to what you're used to in japan uh <clears throat> actually our practice was uh Let's say we go five days a week or six days a week. Uh, four days were dedicated to techniques. And we'd go like uh, 45 minutes technique only. Then we may go full goal, maybe one or two matches. Then one day, I think it was Tuesdays, it was full goal time. For how and long? That a couple hours, you know. And, okay, again, the room it, it was very small. The Oklahoma State wrestling room was very small, and it, let, just think about it. Just to have a one piece of mat, you know. Let's say you have a circle, and that mat does not fit in the room, so the mat was cut in uh, two pieces so three quarter of 
mat was in the room and there's the extra pieces hanging on the side. Okay, so you got about 40 kids wrestling. You can't go you know, <laughs> 20 pairs wrestling at the same time. So we took turns, you know what I mean? Breaking half and half. So you got about four or five pairs going at the same time. Full go. And there's no, my time, there's no pads around the wall, walls. It, it's a, <laughs> like a cinder block, walls, and you got a window. So it used to be a classroom made into a wrestling room. So we had people going, you know, elbow goes into glass windows. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is before the dungeon was what they used to call it, right? Yeah, before the dungeon in the basement. Got it. Yeah, I never seen the basement of wrestling down there. It used to be a indoor track down there, dirt, dirt track downstairs. So the you know track team cannot go outside. They run downstairs. We we did some running down there too. Dirt, dirt. It's like a, you know, what do you call this? Horse. Mm-hmm. Horse. <laughs> <laughs> and you had some legendary teammates at Oklahoma State, one of which was the great Bobby Douglas. What yeah. was he what was he like back then? Okay. Bobby and I was roommate one time. Okay. He went when he had transferred in from uh West Liberty and uh we got along pretty well and you know we worked out if we can't get in the wrestling room, we just wrestled on the football field or <laughs> practice field, grass, grass field there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> then if it rains, we go up in the room, take down a mattress, two mattress down on the floor, and <laughs> we work down the stuff there. <laughs> and... Then I figure out something uh, after the practice, you know, that those, again, the windows, those old, old windows, you, you push it out and push it, you know, pull back in. Then there's a latch. So what I did was I just, just left the latch open, and, but it looks like a closed. So like a Sunday or Saturday, no practice. I come in from outside, you know, the, I know which window is open. So I sneak right in. Sneak right in there. Then we worked out. Were you guys <laughs> wrestling freestyle all summer back then? Uh, you know what? We didn't do much wrestling after season's over. Some, some uh, wrestlers wrestle like a freestyle. That, those time, those years, I wrestled the AAU, you mm -hmm. know, freestyle. I wrestled a uh, couple times, AAU, national tournaments. And your brother, how much older was he when you got to Oklahoma State? He was about four years older. So he was finishing up when I was coming in. And did he stay around and coach you when you were at Okie State? Uh, he stuck around maybe a year. Got it. I think, yeah. And then, I mean, it's just crazy to me that this pipeline of great Japanese wrestlers came over during the 60s and 70s and, you know, really dominated. And you look, no one dominated more than Yutaki. That's someone who yeah. I, you know, I don't know a lot about, but I, I'd love to hear just your take on, you know, what made him so dominant during that era. Okay. Um, Yojiro, okay. Yojiro Uetake and I were the same age, coming out from the same area, different schools. So I knew him from uh, the tournaments. We were in the same tournaments, different weight class. He's, he's, uh, 55 kilo when I was 52. Uh, 
and sometimes, you know, I watch him. I watch him. He was pretty good. And, um, you know, one tournament, he he got beat. And uh, I don't know. I laughed at him or something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he came into uh, Stillwater after I finished my first year. So he came in and I, I took care of his, like uh, all the paperwork and, you know, admission process and whatever. And we spent a lot of time. So we spent uh, one summer uh, in a ranch in Colorado. The guy owned the uh, ranch in Colorado. He's, he was a, uh, Oklahoma State grads it used to be Oklahoma A and M mm -hmm. grad, and he signed a, you know, all Japanese foreign students papers as a sponsor. Mm -hmm. They had to have a kind of sponsor guarantee, guarantor, uh, to, to you know, to go to school there. But he didn't give me anything, you know. I he <laughs> sponsored, but just signed the paper but anyways uh <clears throat> he owned he owned the ranch so one summer yojo and i went there spent whole summer three you know june july and august working there we did almost everything on the ranch you know i i learned how to mill cows you know, that was my job. Get up at like six in the morning, go down there and milk two cows. And that was the milk that we were drinking. And the people who lived, you know, the, the uh, foreman of the ranch also drink that milk from those two cows. <laughs> then uh, we did whatever they ask us to do. Sometimes go out in a bale of hay, uh, orchard nearby, they need people to, you know, pick fr fruits and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We did that. Then after everything's over, we had a mat, wrestling mat in the, the barn, real working barn. One side, there's horses in there. Then we had an open space. It's a dirt floor, but we had a mat on it. And then, we worked out, Yojo and me, and a couple kids from the ranch, and another guy from the uh, ranch came in and work out. Sometimes people from outside came in and work out. Mm -hmm. We had a, actually one kid from the ran ranch hand uh, became a state champion in Colorado. I mean Look at those workout partners, though. <laughs> then there's another guy who was that NCAA champion, uh, Bill Byers. I don't know if you, you look him up. He's from uh, Colorado State College. Okay. I can Bill Byers, I think. He used to come out and work out with us. I'll so, look him up. What? Yeah. So what, you know, if you look at, the the that summer and you guys trained together what, what did what did uh Yutaki do really well like compared to his competitors or was he just well-rounded he was pretty good at a take that and defending himself you know but i you know i i took him down he gets very right back you know <laughs> <laughs> and then your second year you qualify for the NCAA tournament and then win it as a junior. Yeah. Tell us about your first title. What, what memories do you have of that tournament? That was pretty good. You know what happened was the first year, it was a 64. That they switched the uh, takedown rules. I don't know if you know about that. Mm -mm. First takedown, okay, just to keep Oklahoma State from winning in the NCAA uh, rules committee got together and said, you know, takedown rules must be 
changed. So first takedown is two points. Okay. The second takedown on is one point. <laughs> okay. So you take him down two points. You, the other guy escapes one point. Next takedown is one. But the other guy still have two points takedown. You you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. That's so how long was that so, the case for? Uh it went on till it was 65, 64, 63, three years. 66, it went back to regular two point takedowns all the way through. So, what happened was it, it slowed down the matches, but Oklahoma State won 64. 65, we took second to Iowa State. Then 66, we won again. So it did not do much harm to Oklahoma State. You know what I mean? So what, Oklahoma Two State was known as the takedown let him up team? Yes, yes, yes. It was going up like that from uh, 1950s, 50, late 50 on. We, you know, take him down and let him go. Take him down and let him go. There's no uh, tech rules then. Mm. So you can have 20 takedowns, you know, mm -hmm. then the other guy has 20 escapes. <laughs> <laughs> Would you see that that often? So, what's that? The points? Yeah, like the scores running up like that, like ridiculous scores, like 40-20, uh, stuff like that. I didn't see 40-20, but, you know, my final match in the NCAA was I got six takedowns. And the other guy had six escapes. Okay. Then I have one, one for uh, uh, riding time and one escape. And it's, you know what the score was? Nine to six. <laughs> It's so yeah. deceiving to look at that. You know, you would think it'd be a barn burner, but you're you're rolling the guy up. Yeah. So you know what what we did? We learned how to ride. And you know, saving the protecting the, the takedown points. Mm -hmm. So you know, two, first takedown two points. The second one and one. So you go two points, then he escapes two to one. Then I, you know, you take him down. That's three to one and try to finish that period just like that. If he escapes, he's, you know, three to two. And then if he gets that takedown, he's still got the two in his back pocket. So, you know, things can change yeah. quickly. Wow, sure. that's crazy. Reminds me of the uh, the horrible days of when wrestling had that ball, the ball grab. You know, that was where. Oh, yeah, ball grabs and uh, whatever. Flip coins. Uh, yeah. Clinches. It, like those are dark days. Then uh, I had to wrestle one time in 64. Uh, if you draw tie score, the tiebreaker was uh, way in. You weigh in after the match. And light, lighter guy wins. <laughs> what? <laughs> how, long, how long were the periods back then? That was... Uh, Nine minutes. Yeah, I can't remember. It was a break or no break. Uh, it was, I can't remember though. There, three, 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 you think? Yeah. And uh, one time, my time, it was uh, four periods, six minutes on the feet. Then you go two minutes down, two minutes up. You know, you, you switch it, you know, part here, mm -hmm. down position. You go down for two minutes, and the other guy goes on top for two minutes. And if you flip him, like crotch left or whatever, you, you get two points. Then you go down, go down again for that period. The next period, reverse the situation you go on top for two minutes 
see how many times you can score. Then last period, uh, it was a total of 15 minutes. So it was like a six, 10, another, I can't remember how long it lasted. But that was folk There's style a, or freestyle? No, this is freestyle. There's another period of a wrestling on the feet. Holy smokes. That's, so, that's, yeah. Then, then a few years later, they put in the, uh, rules that if you score more than three points in the first period, you have a choice of going, finishing up the match on your feet. So, you know, let's say if you, I wrestle with you, I score three points in the first period. Mm -hmm. Their match was like, a, let's say, six minutes on the feet. I score three, more than three points. Then I get the choice of wrestling on the feet until the end of the match. I'm with you. Yeah. Man, that's crazy though to think about 15 minutes. Now it's now it's six and it's a it's a pretty quick six because you know not guys aren't going out of bounds that often. And in those days you can jump out of out of bounds, no score. <laughs> jump out? Yeah, you can jump out. <laughs> wow. And then once you, you know, after you won your junior year, you returned to the NCAAs and you run into Rick Sanders in the semis. Yeah. Had you wrestled him before that? No, no. Was he a well-known guy or kind of just coming up? I think he was already known as a NAIA mm. champion. Uh, what happened was I he got hurt in Big 8 finals two weeks earlier and what happened was it's not broken but separate the uh, rib cage I finished the match uh, then two weeks later I had to you know wrestle the uh, NCAA and I was getting an uh, injection before every match. So those days you can give you shots on the mat. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor goes on the mat and give you a shot on the shoulder or whatever, you know? So I was getting shots every, before every match in the training room. All the guys looking at me and said, what's going on here? <laughs> so, but anyways, uh, it didn't help much. And what happened was uh, when I wrestled Sanders, uh, score was eight to eight going to third period. Okay. And he it was on top and he flipped me over. Then I my body was like, a, I was looking up the ceiling. And I said, oh, I can't, my you know, rib is hurting. So I said, okay, that was it. Got the end. <laughs> Battle back for third though. And like you said, Oklahoma State, yeah. um, believe they won it that year. And, and I, I was going back to 64, Oklahoma State had five in the finals, four got second. I mean, like just the teams you guys were on back then were just stacked. Those guys are sophomores. The guys that, you know, we're in the in the finals. Three mm -hmm. guys of sophomores, I think. Or yeah, then we got a Joe James and the Bruce Go. Uh, another the guy Zweiker. Those guys were in there. And then after Oklahoma State, you ended up in Ohio. How did you get involved with the St. Ed's program? Uh, what happened was my, my sons were wrestling, the little kids, you know, the, oh, you know, I used to go to St. Ed's practice, um, then the coach, uh, Howard Ferguson, I don't know if you yeah. remember, yeah, yeah. he, 
he saw my sons and he started giving me t-shirts and stuff, you know. <laughs> Smart guy doing a little recruiting. Yeah. T-shirts and put his name, the kid's name on it and stuff. And then uh, we had this team in Illyria, uh, Ohio, in Illyria Catholic High School. Uh, we came up with, they, they, we used to have a CYO program in uh, Cleveland. And we wrestled every Sunday, dual meet. And so my two sons are wrestling and a bunch of kids, uh, uh, his, my friend, uh, you know, my kids' friends told them to come out wrestling. Those guys never wrestled before. Like, That's okay, just come out wrestling. So we end up in the winning the city championships in dual meet, undefeated. Mm -hmm. And that's when uh, uh, the, uh, actually they got recruited into uh, St. Ed's program. Then I went there also as their assistant coach. And did you work with like Alan Free during that era, any of those guys in the 80s? Or was it after that? Uh, I was there much earlier. You know, Silvestro and class of 82. Ilensky? Ilensky, uh, Greg Ilensky, and those guys are there. Heffernan's, okay, so that crew. I mean, yeah. That that's just so, such a long time for those guys to be producing champions. I mean, all the way through the the '90s when your boys were going through there. I mean, that's that's an incredible run. Now, but I remember, I go remember uh, Free. You know, Free's been uh, recruited, and I, I, I tried to send him to uh, Bobby Douglas to uh, Arizona State. I think he, he visited there, but what, what happened was, I don't know if you remember Joe Gonzalez. Yeah. Yeah, he was there as an assistant coach and Joe's kind of crazy guy. He he showed, I think, uh, Alan uh, Rattlesnake in the bag or something. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, to me, I would think Alan Freed would like that from what I know about the guy. He, he went to Oklahoma State. <laughs> of course, this is during the era where John Smith was just larger than life, you know, so I, th I think that had a little bit to do with it. I mean, and obviously you're, uh, you know, Oklahoma State through and through. Did you have any interactions with Coach Smith over the years, like when you're on that 88 Olympic team? Coach who? Smith? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I used to sit in his corner, and uh, like he, when he was wrestling for Sunkist, mm -hmm. and I was part of the coaching staff there, and I, I used to sit in John's corner. I didn't, you know, I don't have to do anything; just sit there. <laughs> you know? He, he, uh, I think it was Tech was fifteen points then, and he he beat. Uh, Tom Brands, 15 to nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, that's an epic video. I think that was the US Open in like 91 or 90. And yeah, he's just like a dart on those low singles. Yeah. Now I want to get into a little bit of your coaching philosophy. I've heard a couple of things just that you've mentioned in past interviews that are really interesting. One is this notion of repeating something like 29 times before it becomes part of your habit. Yeah. 27. What, tell us about that. Where did that come from? 27 times. It came from Bobby Douglas. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where he came from. He, he tells, you know, kids, so you got to repeat at least 27 times, same, same move or same thing. And, if you do that same thing with the uh, other things, like you try to remember phone numbers, you repeat the phone numbers 27 times, then you remember it. So that's, that's the Bobby Douglas golden rule. 
Yeah, that was Bobby Douglas. So I, I, I stole it from him. Uh, but you can go, you know, 50 times or 30 times or whatever, you know, position. Mm -hmm. You know, you write down something, you know, 27 times, then that becomes yours. I'm going to take that from this interview. I'm going to use that. While we're on, yeah. while we're on Bobby, tell us about the painting of him wrestling Gable. Were, were you there for okay. that one? No, I wasn't there. Well, that, that was, I think, a trial, final trials for one of those world games or one of those championships. I don't remember which one. But he, he made a poster out of that, printed it. And I, you know, he asked me to do a painting. I said, okay, I'll do it for you. That was, I can't remember what year, but it's now hanging in the National Hall of Fame. That's awesome. It must have been like 71, Gable won the world, 72, the Olympics. So it must have been like 70 or 69 because Bobby was maybe three or four and oh against Gable. No, he's nine and oh. Nine and oh. Yeah. yeah. Wow. He, you know, actually, after Bobby left Stillwater, he went to Iowa State to be. Dan Gable's workout partner. Really? He was there as assistant coach. The match during that era I would have loved to see would have been Gable versus Mohavid from Iran, but he defected right at the beginning of the 72 Olympics. And it's like, that would have been a dream match. Yeah. The other thing I've heard you talk about in terms of coaching is teaching a single leg with a broomstick. Could you tell us about that? Yeah. Okay. What happened was uh, that takedown, a single leg takedown, they call it Japanese style or Japanese dump. And I was doing that when I was still in Japan. And I tried to figure out what I was doing. And uh, and I tried to find out what's the best way to teach that particular move. And I was interested in the, in the uh, leverage. And so when you, you lever the leg, actually it's a thigh. There's only one bone from the knee up to the hip joint. Mm -hmm. But you lever that part of the leg actually you can move your opponent to that side of the whatever you call it uh, supporting foot so only thing he can do is hop so I, i'll make him hop and as he lands right before he lands i will pull that leg it's make him split. So when he lands, his legs are split open. You, you can just go to the front and go fall down. Okay? Mm -hmm. So to do that, and I figure out what's the best way to explain. So something I needed, like a stick, you know, piece of stick to show the uh, leverage. So to find the fulcrum and the mm -hmm. force you move that lever to to move your opponent. That's why I use a broomstick. Okay. You was, can always find a broomstick in the gym. A broom. I was gonna ask how how was it received by the guys when you when you busted out the old broomstick? Hold on. Okay, just a second. It was you broke up a little bit. Couldn't no figure problem. Out what... I can still hear you. I was just asking what the guy's reaction was when you pulled out the broomstick during a practice. Oh, oh they, they thought I was crazy. <laughs> you know, first I brought it up like, uh, you know, Greg Elansky and those guys. 
and then later on they figure out what's the you know leverage is so you know people still remember you know that crazy guy comes out with the broomstick <laughs> And the last thing I wanted to ask you about in terms of coaching, then we'll let you go is, is visualization. Is that something that you've learned and the Japanese culture still practices in terms of preparing for a competition? Uh, I, I'm sure they do that. Yeah, I'm sure they do that. And you know what? I had a teammate when I was in high school and I used to, you know, go through the different moves and things, work out or whatever. And this guy was sitting down doing nothing, right? So how come you don't practice? He said, I'm doing that in my mind, he says. He's projecting himself into different images or imagery. So he was maybe the first guy be doing that at that time when I was in high school. And I thought he was lazy. I don't know. Maybe it could be, <laughs> you know, grandkids. My my grandson, see, well, how come you're not doing anything? I'm doing that in my mind. <laughs> you know? How come you're not doing push-ups? I'm doing it in my mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... Did you start to use it after that? Yeah, I, you know, that I do that now a lot. You know, how, how to teach the certain moves. Mm -hmm. And I, I do my mind. So when I teach, you know, that particular move or whatever, it comes out pretty well. So you break it down in your mind first before you even teach something? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I do. And that the book you have behind you there is, you know, you wrote a book on wrestling technique a few years ago. And yeah. do you still use that same kind of basis of like a, a technical approach to how you teach it? Or has it completely changed since then? Uh, I do more on that single leg takedowns. You know, I call it now is it's uh, the ultimate single leg takedown drill. And I like to do it for a guy like uh, Kyle Dake, uh, Jordan Boris, and those guys. And I, I think they're missing just the little things like a little, a little of a leverage before you do anything else. So you could see that just that, by watching those? You know, those guys yeah all you have to do is do that little thing and they can take anybody down that's what i i tell the kids is you do this you can take anybody down every time and Why what's the secret just just understand the principle of leverage and balance you know shifting away from here to there because you got two legs. Some some wrestlers have legs. But most of the rest, you know, if you have two legs, two arms, and you should be able to do all the things based on leverage and balance and a center of gravity. And last thing we ask coaches, you know, this podcast is called Wrestling Changed My Life. What has wrestling given you over the years? Um, contact with uh, people in the world and helping some wrestlers or wrestling related people to advance their endeavor, you know, making contacts for them so they can go to the school here and there, get a jobs in different mm -hmm. places. And that's what I've been doing lately. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We appreciate it, Tadaki.
Thank you. Have a great day.